So welcome to this week's episode of Leaders on a Mission, where I'm joined by inspiring leaders driven by the impact of creating a healthy and sustainable world. Now, in today's episode, I'm joined by Mark Harima, CEO and co-founder of New Light Technologies, a company using biotechnology to create um, a carbon capture technology that literally takes greenhouse gases, creates novel polymers that can be used in a range of products that essentially help reduce carbon emissions and our pollution footprint. And um, Mark, it's brilliant to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for coming to uh, to join as a guest and talk through your journey. Great to be here. Thank, thanks for having me. Excellent, excellent. So tell me, just, just like taking it all the way back as a, as, a, as a young Mark kind of growing up, maybe just talk about some of those kind of, you know, the key influences on you growing up. Um, well, sometimes I, I mention that uh, one of my my favorite movies and a, a movie that was very influential to me, sort of a, a chapter of my Bible, as, as it were, um, was this very uh, beautiful, romantic, poetic movie called Terminator 2. And um, in, in this movie, <laughs> as, as, as you may recall, if you've seen it, um, there's this line that really sticks out and it, and it talks about uh, no fate. And more specifically, there's no fate but what we make for ourselves, and that that was a that was very stirring for me because um, it represented this idea that you know that the story's not yet written, and there it, it, it's it's just that there's no there's not a a predetermined thing that's going to happen, and and that creates both great danger and great hope because on the one hand, uh, if we think about it in environmental terms. What it means is that the worst is possible. You know, we it is we are on a trajectory right now to fill the oceans with plastic, 2050 more plastic than fish. Like that's the path that we're on right now. Um, and sometimes I think we have a certain sense of yeah, but there's no way we're going to let that happen. Actually, that that could happen. Um, and same thing with climate change. We we could get to a place where we truly just ruin this thing. Um, and so, the worst is possible. But by the exact same token, by, by that same function, the best is also possible. It does mean that even though climate change feels so uh, big and almost so big that how are we ever going to fix it, um, that, that story is not yet written either. You know, we do have the ability to come together and to make massive change, and we can fix this thing. Um, and so I think, you know, that was something for me um, growing up that I always I always felt like whenever anybody told me, hey, this is how it is, it's like, who says? Why, Why? I mean, you know, we, we each, no one's the authority in the future, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, so when, when I came across this newspaper article about, about methane emissions, um, uh, you know, my mind was predisposed to say, why can't we do something different? Why do we have to keep Everyone's just shouting at each other. Um, you know, we should do this or shouldn't do that. Maybe we tax it. Maybe we put it underground. And we, what we ended up doing is shouting at each other for the past 30 years. And, you know, not there. Look, there has been a ton of a ton of advances, but it's 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 unfortunate to see we still don't have global unity. We're getting closer, but uh, but it's taken a long time to get global unity on fixing this problem. So um, so we just said, hey, look. We're gonna we're gonna take a different approach. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And, and tell me, um, that must have been a kind of mindset you have from a young age, right? Basically, quest, you know, you mentioned about the film as being an influence, but I would have thought having a curious, questionable kind of mindset. If you're questioning the future and what's possible, um, was that something that you you have from a young age, for instance? Yeah, I'm going to get way too deep here. So forgive me. Uh, <laughs> but my parents were divorced when I was a little kid. And, and, you know, I think everyone responds in a different way. You know, when you're a little kid, mom plus dad is like your, your first truth, right? Like that is, that's your truth. And when that breaks, you say, well, huh, if that wasn't, if that's not the case, then, then I, I, at least this is my theory, I could be totally wrong, but the theory is that then you start asking, well, okay, well, what else, you know, like what's, what's behind this thing? You, you, it forces you to 
question things more. Um, and so I think, I think at least for me, maybe that was an influence. Um, I, I do distinctly remember this one time, I, I think it must've been like third or fourth grade or something. And um, I was playing with the neighborhood kids and we had rollerblades and, and this one kid was, uh, he said, Hey, let's go build a ramp. And, um, uh, we were going to go find some, some wood or something and, and, and build a ramp and, um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Whatever. And he said, no, no, let's go do it. And okay. So we went and I think we found like an old construction site and, and grabbed some of that stuff. And, and then we, we got it and we, we built this ramp and I'll never forget looking at it being like, oh my gosh, like we said we were going to do it. And then we went out and we did it. And just that, that like manifestation of like taking that idea and becoming physical was just so striking to me that we can, in fact, like you have the ability to, to, to question things or, or come up with ideas and then bring those into life. Um, so the, for some reason that incident like really stuck out to me. Maybe it kind of gave you that confidence or that belief. It's, you know, that actually you can do this. And, you know, it was just that, uh, you know, getting, you know, getting the experience of actually completing it and what that feels like and knowing that you can do it essentially. Yeah. And that's a really good, it's a really good point because, you know, in new lights life, the first 10 years we had no website. Um, it was a, you know, we were just in our, this converted car garage, you know, working our technology and it, and it took a long time to, to get it right. Um, and sometimes people have asked, you know, what, what kept you going? Um, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out, <laughs> but, um, but, but one thing I do recall is that when you'd have a little win, it meant the world, um, just a little tiny bit of success. And you're like, well, wait a minute, if we can do that, you know, maybe we can do a little bit more too. So yeah, that, that, that little bit that you mentioned that it, I found those little wins to be really important. Yeah, no, no great. Because, um, you know, clearly, when you finish your 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 your, your degree, for instance, um, you know, what were you giving some thought for towards career and opportunity at that point? Because it seemed that you went straight from your degree to co-founding New Light, really. So maybe just talk a little bit around, uh, you know, about that and how you came to actually, you know, co-found the business. Yeah, you know, when I was in college, I was trying to figure out what, what I wanted to do. Um, I had loaded up so heavy on science in high school, you know, AP everything, environmental science and, and all, all the other things um, that when I, when I got to Princeton, I, I actually wanted to, you know, explore the other side of things. So philosophy and religion and history and, and politics. Um, and so I was considering, you know, maybe law, maybe, maybe other things. Um, my my junior year i got really sick um and spent about a year seeing a ton of different doctors and, and nobody could figure out what it was i lost 25 pounds ended up having internal bleeding um and it was incredibly frustrating and also scary because i just didn't know what it was um what was and, it well it turned out to be celiac and and back then it was highly underdiagnosed um and so uh, yeah, that, it was that was a rough year. Um, but uh, as as part of that, I said, okay, I, I think I'm going to go a different path. I want to try to figure this out. So I was planning to do do a post back and then and then go to med school. Um, so that was the that was the track I was on. Um, but then the summer between my junior and senior year, um, I was reading through the the newspaper, the LA Times, and you know, one of the really terrible symptoms of celiac is your digestive system just falls apart in all kinds of lovely ways. And so I was reading through the newspaper and I read this article, saw the title, and it was about uh, methane emissions from cows. So <laughs> given where I was, uh, it caught my eye. And um, so I read this article and it talks about uh, the amount of methane that each cow burps per day. And it's 600 liters per cow, per dairy cow per day. And it was like this, well, wait a minute, because climate change is so broad uh, and, and, it, and it feels like this thing is hard to get your arms around, but that specific number, all of a sudden you can, you can do some math with that and you, you divide it by dollars per million BTU, whatever. It turns out that each cow was, was burping about $20 per year in value. 
And there's a, wait a minute. So a thousand cow farm is putting $20,000 of value into the air every year. Well, now hold on a second, because we talk about taxing or, or burying or whatever, but this is like, forget all the debate for a moment. This is material that has value and it's going into the air. There's gotta be a different way to, to approach this. Um, and kind of simultaneous to this, I had become really uh, enamored with the, the idea of using market or consumer driven solutions to solving problems. Um, so for instance, my, my senior thesis was about trying to looking for a market driven solution to reducing uh, world hunger. And, and so this, this idea emerged that summer of, well, wait a minute, if we could find a way to turn greenhouse gas into useful products, then potentially we would have a pathway to enabling consumers themselves to drive carbon out of the air by using this material as opposed to something over here. Um, and so uh, after working on this idea for a little bit, I called up my, my childhood friend uh, who is studying biomedical engineering at Northwestern. And I said, hey, there's, this, there's a lot of carbon going into the air, obviously, but um, I think maybe people are looking at this the wrong way. You know, what if we used it as, as a resource? And um, so we started plugging away and that was, that was the beginning of our journey. Wow, excellent, excellent. That's, uh, that really is kind of fascinating. And um, so that was 17 years ago, right? That, that, so that this is New Light as co-founder and CEO of New Light is your first job, essentially. Post you. Uh, well, te uh, technically, I, I, yeah. I, <laughs> Uh, my, my parents were teachers and uh, my first job was, was uh, doing phone duty. They, they did a extension course for university teachers. And then I had the very prestigious uh, uh, role of, of being a um, cabana boy <laughs> for a local hotel. And then uh, in the early days of New Light uh, to sort of fund the lab development, I did uh, hotel bell hopping and Kenton did, did ballet. So we've had it. We and then I worked for uh, Merrill Lynch for a summer and did some law things. But um, but but aside from those small stints, yeah, New Light's the only thing that I've done since uh, for the past seventeen years. Got it. No, great. So so I suppose on that journey when you joined and you you know working on the technology and you had the vision around what you could do with Bfame, for instance. You know, did you you know where, where were your thoughts around what you could create? Did you have a vision in your mind in terms of what that might look like for you? We didn't, we didn't know. I mean, at, at first it was just trying to figure out what could you do with, with greenhouse gas. Um, and after doing research for a few months, we discovered that there are naturally occurring microorganisms that exist um, throughout nature, but especially in, in the ocean that eat methane uh, and CO2 as their food source. And um, so initially that, that alone was compelling. And then we further discovered that um, when they grow, one of the, the things that they make inside of their cells is this material called PHB. Um, and as we looked into it further, we discovered, you know, we don't, people don't grow up learning about PHB, but it turns what out that- PHB? PH What is PHB by the way? So PHB stands for polyhydroxybutyrate. And what it is, is an energy material. We all, almost all known living things make it. Um, so we're making it right now in the body, trees, plants, animals, microorganisms, uh, almost all life makes it. And um, the reason microorganisms make it is because if they find themselves in a, some sort of stress condition uh, and they can't grow, they, they build up this energy reserve material. It's kind of like fat or muscle um, in, in a sense, it, but it helps them survive and, and thrive. Um, and so we discovered that, and others knew about this, so we, we just learned it for ourselves, um, that these microorganisms from the ocean make this stuff when they eat methane or CO2. So we said, well, wait a minute, hold on. So we could, we could take greenhouse gas, feed it to these natural microorganisms, do what nature does, turn it into PHB. And, okay, cool. Well, but what can you do with PHB? Turns out that when you uh, extract and isolate PHB, you can turn it into a powder and then a pellet, and that stuff is meltable. So all of a sudden, if it's meltable, you can use it to replace plastic. But here's the big difference. Because nature makes it in every ecosystem, um, nature understands it. 
in, in every ecosystem on the planet, if it, if it ends up there, it's seen as a food source. So nature reconsumes it, uh, whereas, whereas synthetic plastic, the reason it doesn't break down is because it's synthetic. So nature just doesn't understand it. It just sits there. PHB, on the other hand, is consumed like a banana peel or, or a piece of candy. So, okay, now we can turn greenhouse gas not only into a material that can replace plastic, but also a material that is um, uh, degradable. And further, when this thing happens in nature, that's a carbon negative process. It's taking greenhouse gas and it's sinking it into a material in a carbon negative way. So if you can, if you can do that with renewable power and greenhouse gas, you have this beautiful package of, we can do it in a naturally carbon negative way, and we can create a material that goes away if it ever ends up in the environment. So that was deeply compelling to us. Um, but we said, okay, well, first of all, we weren't the first to have that idea. We just came, we, we, we saw that it was there. Um, and so we said, well, why haven't other people been able to bring that to, to the market? And it really came down to two things and that was price and performance. So um, we are deeply, you know, a market driven company. In other words, you know, I think that you want to build things that don't rely on, for instance, subsidies and premiums and things of that nature, because the world goes through shifts and um, ultimately you, you want to provide great, great products. And so the next 10 years was spent trying to figure out how to drive down price and get performance to the point where it could directly compete with, you know, oil-based plastics. And that's, that's what we spent the next decade doing. Got it. Okay. Wicked. And so tell me a little bit around that journey, um, you know, over the 10 years in terms of, you know, must have been some big kind of roller coasters and, uh, and uh, you know, interesting times. But yeah, just, just maybe outline a couple of things about that journey. Steady progress, um, plenty of setbacks, some great advances, but just, just sort of a, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going no matter what attitude. And um, so it started uh, from paper studies, then we moved into a laboratory, um, started to get our feet wet with the basic tech. Um, and then we moved into a pilot plant back in 2007, late 2006 and early 2007. Um, and then the, the, the real kind of in the cave journey was 2007 through 2013. Um, and we, we built a number of um, bioreactors and all the systems required to carry out this process. And it went from, you know, <laughs> we, we had a lot to learn. Um, and it went from very basic and very crude to steady increase in sophistication over time. Um, and we built countless lines, countless iterations. Um, and there were these moments kind of like what we were talking about earlier, these, these, a lot of frustration and then punctuated by these small wins that kind of said, okay, I think we can, we can get there. And a lot of that was just naive hope, but, but it drove us. Um, and so we just kept working it, kept working it. And finally, um, as the years progressed, we kept advancing to the point where our cost structure kept coming down. The simplicity of our process kept um, increasing. And by 2013, we finally had a platform that we said there is a clear pathway here where we can compete uh, on price and performance with incumbent. And so at that point, we scaled to a, a partner manufacturing facility where we went from a, a 10 foot tall reactor to a 50 foot tall reactor. And that was a massive breakthrough moment for us because at that point, you know, the sort of dialogue was, well, okay, you can do it at this scale, but like, can you, can you really do it at a scale that matters? And also we were just, you know, we were material limited. Um, and so in August of, of 2013, we, we scaled uh, to this 50 foot tall, approximately reactor. And uh, it, was, it was one of the most meaningful and, and kind of touching moments you know, in my life. Um, we kind of went all in on that. And I've, I had scaled and have since scaled many reactor lines. And I'll tell you that usually it doesn't go uh, perfectly the first time around. And, and this, when we scaled, when we did that, it was, it was pretty darn close to what we were doing at Pilot, which is rare, um, and, but it kind of needed to happen. Um, and, and, and 
fortunately it did. It did. Um, and so two things happened. One, we, we showed that we could operate this tech at commercially meaningful scale. And two, it gave us enough material to start to introduce products into the market. Um, and I, you know, I remember driving home from, from that and just the, the emotion that was <laughs> kind of welling up uh, was, it was uh, something I'll never forget. You know, when you, when you work on something for 10 years and then you finally see it operating and looking down at this, this huge reactor and it's working and doing great. And it was just, it was very cool. And, and, and um, was a really meaningful springboard moment to then do all the things that we've done since. Oh, no, that's great. No, thanks for sharing. And uh, maybe you enjoy it a little bit more because of the journey, you know, as opposed to, you know, if you would have got there quicker or sooner, it wouldn't have been as tasty when you got there, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh... Well, yeah, I look, I certainly wish it had all gone faster. Um, manufacturing is, is a beast and, and biological manufacturing is its own special flavor. Um, and, 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 it, and it takes time and I agree it, it probably the, the sweetness probably increases by, by virtue of the, the struggle that it takes to get there. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it was just the path that, that we went down and, and from our perspective, what we had to do to get there. Great. No, absolutely. And tell me with PHB, are there therefore, um, is that a, a molecule or product that is just sold in the market, but it's just made via petrochemical um route is it is it is there, is there an incumbent market for that um uh, not really so um phas in general have been made by by a number of other companies over many years so you can you can get phb on the market it's uh, uh, well some phb but other uh, phas as well including phbv and others um so there are there are manufacturers out there um with that said, the production capacity globally has been extremely limited for a long time, uh, in large part due to, to price and performance. And, um, and so, yes, you can get it, um, but it, to say that there's a market per se, um, it's, a, it's an early developing market. Yeah, okay, I got it. And what is it generally used for? Is it like an intermediary um, molecule? Um, Actually, um, think of it just just like um, it's it's a direct replacement for many types of, of plastic. So, when we make uh, and we by the way we call this material air carbon. When we make air carbon, we turn it into a powder and then a pellet, and then we can form it into into shapes directly. So, as an example, this straw here is made from air carbon, um, and it's ninety nine point nine percent air carbon, a um, little bit of processing aid. And um, we put this into what's called an extruder that melts it and turns it into a, a tube. And then we, we cut that and then out comes a straw. Um, and what's cool is we can use the same equipment that was previously using uh, making plastic straws. Um, we change the temperatures just a little bit, but we can use the same equipment and, and make a, you know, the straw here that otherwise would have been made from plastic and never would have gone away. And now it's made from air carbon and, and will go away. So we can turn it into finished goods fairly simply. For instance, this is a, a fork. Um, so it just it, it's a, just a natural material that happens to be meltable and moldable. Excellent. Oh, really? That was really good. I, look, I'm feeling as well that really the journey for you, you know, clearly you were really kind of driven by the impact that this technology could have in the world, right? And uh, and you know that that's clearly the thing that's kind of sustained you, as it were, is that kind of true north star, as it were. How, how impactful when you when you think about the future and you think about you know the climate change and the issues that we have, you know how how much of an impact could te your technology and, and and other technologies have in in really addressing that uh, situation? The, the molecule type that we make, we believe, can can end the accumulation of, of plastic in the ocean this generation. So um, what, why am I that, that confident? I mean, you take these, these products, this, this goes away. It, it does not persist in the environment. So if you can imagine, so this, this straw is projected, it depends on the, which ocean type and temperatures and whatever, but on average goes away in about a year. Um, imagine if you could snap your fingers right now and everything in the ocean, all that plastic is gone within a year. Um, so what we're aiming to do is within the next 
five to seven years uh, introduced to the market over 90% of the product types that currently end up in the ocean and replace them with air carbon based products and show that, hey, look, this thing, we, we can't end this. Um, now, it's going to take a heck of a lot of time and money to scale because we have to put in a whole lot of production capacity. But the point is, it can be done. And so um, uh, I don't mean to, to say that to downplay the, the massive scope uh, that that is in front of us. Um, so it, it won't be easy, but it is possible. Um, and so we, we you know, working together with, with, with partners, um, we want to be part of our, our, our mission is to end the accumulation of plastics in the ocean in this generation. Um, with regard to the carbon side, look, the, the volumes are so big that there's, as with all of these efforts, there has to be so many people involved in so many different technologies. Um, but where our contribution we think comes in is, is to show that, hey, we can make materials and products that don't add carbon to the atmosphere. In fact, in the same way that when you grow a tree, it reverses carbon, we can make products in the same way. So we've, we've launched as an example, um, carbon negative uh, leather replacements using air carbon. And that has a net uh, negative carbon impact. And, um, you know, if, if nothing else, I mean, certainly we, we want to be a, an important slice of the pie in terms of reducing carbon emissions and helping decarbonize various industries like fashion, automotive and so forth. But also um, serving as a point of, uh, of inspiration, saying, well, wait a minute, if we can do that, what else can we do? You know, uh, if, if I can hold carbon in my hand that would otherwise be in the air, then we don't have to sort of keep accepting this, this idea that everything has to go downhill. Everything has to add more carbon. It's not true. You grow a tree, that reverse carbon. So there are processes and technologies that exist on planet Earth today <laughs> that can change the flow of this stuff. And so we, we hope to be a part of inspiring that growing movement in the carbon capture space that we're seeing today. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it's a, a clearly, you know, over the last few years, but more so over the last six months, you've read a lot more about the kind of, uh, there's a lot more of a kind of focus in the press and uh, on, on people's radar, I think, carbon capture and, uh, you know, the, the challenges. I was, I was just going to ask you whether you felt that there had been much of a change, you know, during those 17 years you've been working there in terms of just how important this stuff has become now. And, you know, maybe, I don't know, people, more of a call to arms, more consumers and people that want to be part of contributing to this journey, for instance. 100%. Um, it, it, it has been uh, a very, very interesting dynamic to, to, to watch as it's changed. Um, and I break it into kind of two issues, but they're connected. The, the, the first one is ocean plastics. You know, it's 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 almost hard to imagine right now, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, I don't know, five six years ago, this was not on everybody's radar. You know, and, and then over the past few years, what we've seen is you know all the imagery and, and the statistics and the projections um, have compelled people. Uh, and and there's there's two in particular that I think have been particularly compelling. One was the discovery of this. Uh, massive amount of, of plastic in the ocean. We talked about the, the Pacific garbage patch. Um, I had the great honor of, of meeting with uh, Captain Charlie Moore, the, the, the guy who actually discovered this, this great Pacific garbage patch. Um, but that was compelling. All of a sudden people, they didn't know how much stuff was out there. And then we hear this Texas size amount, you know, it just, that, that, was, um, that was, I think visceral for a lot of people, but even more visceral was when we started to see all these images of plastic and bellies and, and whatnot. And then to cap that, this statistic, this, this projection of more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050 has been such a rally cry. And it's a testament to the organizations that have kind of put that together. Um, and so all of a sudden within the past you know, five, six years, there has been a exponential uh, awareness and demand um, for, uh, for, for the issue and, and, and doing something about it. So, you know, and even us, it's changed. Our, our focus was very much initially on carbon reduction. And then as we stood back, we said, well, wait a minute, we can really have a big impact in solving this, this ocean plastics problem. Um, and that's a big reason, if not the central reason why we've entered into the foodware space and why making straws and forks and knives and all the other things that we're, that we're doing 
um, because look, there's a lot of different things we can do with air carbon. Um, but with a limited amount of time, you know, and, and, and people and resources, we said, sure, we can be the back of a refrigerator, but we'd rather replace that fork or knife that would have otherwise ended up in the ocean. So yes, that has been, there's been a dramatic uptick. And, and today you have consumer driven demand, you have corporate mandates and you have legislative uh, mandates. That's a massive trifecta creating a huge, huge, depending on how you see it, either challenge, vacuum, opportunity. Um, but the world has said, we, we, we must change. And, um, and so that, that has been a, a big shift. And, and also, frankly, if that doesn't give somebody hope, you know, I mean, the world is rallying to fix this problem. That's awesome. You know, and I think one of the things that the pandemic did was it showed that global scale changes is, is acutely possible. Um, and we've seen ESG as an example. Everyone, everyone was curious at the beginning of the pandemic, would sustainability go down? Would people say, hey, you know what? Like, I got work. I got other things to worry about right now. Um, and what we saw was actually the opposite. We saw people say, well, we, you can decide what dynamics you think drove it, but, but there seems to be a sense of, um, hey, there are these big forces out there. And if we don't come up with collective solutions to collective problems, we're all impacted. Um, and so that all has gone up. And, and, and that leads into the second topic, which is climate change. And that, that's just continued to accelerate. I think that's been more of a sort of stepwise growth year over year, although the past couple of years, I would say, has 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 accelerated more than I've ever seen it. More than I'm, I'm sure we all think the same. You know, we, you hear more about carbon capture and companies pledging to go carbon negative and and all these things. And part of it has to do with that the problem keeps getting worse. You know, I mean, when you see the the the, the fires in Australia or the flooding in different parts or or heat waves, yeah, you know we. <laughs> There's been so much effort to try to discredit and, and create doubt in these spaces. But the, 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 the data, if you look at the numbers, it's compelling. It's going like this, <laughs> you know, like you can't, uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it's getting harder for people to discredit that. And thus, uh, as more people feel the urgency, there's, there's more consumer demand, more investor demand, all that is, is going because people want to fix this. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I would figure having to work with a great set of people, for instance, I'm not sure. Do you have co-founders that you that you work with along the journey? I would have thought that relationship would have needed to you know, stand the test of time. Right. And uh, clearly very, very important in, to get you where you are today. Yeah, uh, the, the, the first person I called um, was a guy named Kenton Kimmel. Um, and he's our, our co-founder and CTO. Um, we go all the way back. My mom was actually his fourth grade teacher. <laughs> and then uh, we became good friends in sixth grade. Um, so, you know, we were, we were doing all the things that sixth graders do, like teepeeing houses and, and whatnot. Um, and so we've known each other for a very long time. And then that was before we even started New Light. And so when we, when we kicked things off, we already had a... a um, a lot of trust because we knew each other's character. And um, I, I would say that one of the most important decisions that we ever, uh, that I ever made was, was deciding to team up with Kenton because um, working with someone of the highest character becomes so critical because you're, you know, in our journey, and I think in every journey, you're going to go through so many ups and downs and being able to work with someone who you trust and, and who um, has an alignment of values is it's everything. It's the foundation. Um, and so, you know, he's still with the company today and, and an extremely active part and a, and a core uh, to our success. And um, I view that as one of the most important, you know, parts of, of our company's journey. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you built a full scale for, I mean, what you built on the website I've seen in, in it's near Huntington Beach, isn't it, right? Or, uh, yep. Is that a, um, that's like a full scale kind of facility, right? Yeah, full commercial scale. Um, Eagle 3, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the most beautiful things that I, that I, uh, 
that at least to me. <laughs> um, you know, that, is it Eagle Three? It's called uh... Eagle Three. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it looks uh looks unbelievable. But I'm picturing I haven't been to Huntington. I'm picturing kind of LA and Huntington Beach, and then you've got this thing on the side of it. I mean, it looks beautiful, but it's not where you would imagine a, a manufacturing uh, facility, is it? No, it is not, and and certainly you're not the first to ask uh, why there. You know, we uh, Ken and I are from Orange County, where where Huntington Beach is, and so after college, you know, we moved back, and you know, we were working odd jobs and then trying to go to this lab, and um, eventually we we then uh, raised some capital to build our first pilot plant. So it's like, okay, well, let's go find a pilot plant nearby, and so we started to, to do that. And by the time you know we had gotten to the point where we outgrew our our pilot facility we had i think something on the order of like 15 to 20 uh team members and we we didn't want to lose anybody we didn't want to go to some other part of of the the country um in, in, for, for a number of reasons so we said all right can we find some place nearby where where we can keep everybody and and um and keep moving fast and we happened to find this this location in huntington um that sits right next to a, a Boeing facility. Um, so it was industrially zoned and um, uh, we made it work. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it, it is a little bit odd to have it in, 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 a, in a place where we are, but it works. And um, part of it is a testament to how clean the process is. Um, uh, you know, we were just a very low impact, in fact, a negative impact uh, facility. And so that gives you the ability to operate in places that might otherwise be challenging. Yeah, no, great. And and so so essentially, do you take the um, you know, your feedstock? Does that come, where, where do you get your feedstock from? Is it from the other industrial site nearby, as it were? Um, no. Uh, so over the years, we've used feedstock from a number of different places. Um, early on, we were we were focused on using biogas from from farms. So digester gas from either dairy farms or uh, food waste digesters or, or places like that. Um, we also trialed with uh, landfill gas, uh, which is a really big source of, of carbon emissions, uh, obviously throughout the world. Um, and then we also uh, uh, started to operate with CO2 and on the CO2 pathway, we teamed up with a, with a gas company to collect CO2 as it was coming off of an ethanol uh, facility. Um, and so we use that. And we've also teamed up with, um, with a group that is capturing uh, coal mine methane emissions, and then uh, cleaning that up, putting it into the natural gas grid, and then we buy that through the grid, um, sort of on a wheeled basis. So those are all different ways that, that we've been and, and continue to, to uh, supply the feedstock. Okay, that's great. Really uh, genius, isn't it? It really is. It's uh... Incredible, great journey. And and what about in terms of the scale now, in terms of what you can produce at the kind of pH, PHP as it were? Yeah, so um, Eagle 3 is a really, you know, for us, the, part of the reason why it's so important is it, is it really represents our solar panel. In other words, from here forward, we're really gonna be replicating this, this facility. Um, and so that unlocks our ability to, to grow uh, and, and, and scale. Um, so, so now our focus uh, post Eagle Three is is just growth and, and growing as fast as we can and, and continue to scale air carbon and get it into as many applications as we can. No, that's uh, yeah, that's great, absolutely. And you build new facilities in the U.S. essentially uh, from scratch. Yeah, uh, we're we're primarily focused on North America right now. Obviously, we've got global ambitions. Um, so we'll be working towards those as fast as we can. Um, but but North America is our, our primary focus for the short term. Great. Okay, excellent. And in terms of the applications, you mentioned the food waste space. So that was really neat kind of market. You showed the straws and some of the replacing of the plastic kind of cutlery. What are the other, and you mentioned a little bit around fashion and leather so, uh, replace. What, what are the main other markets apart from the foodware that you're focusing on? Um, yeah, the, the, the fashion market is, is a place that we've gotten into. Um, right now, we, we sell um, eyewear uh, and also small leather goods. So from wallets to, to little um, coin purses to clutches and bags, um, really showing what's possible with this material. 
and uh, we're working on a number of partnerships right now to go into to different industrial spaces with that air carbon leather material. Um, so it's 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 really sort of a showcase for the things that that can that can be. Um, you can imagine, you know, uh, if if a meaningful part of the eyewear market was was a net carbon negative footprint. Um, that's great. We can start to decarbonize different parts of, of, of what we do and, and the products that we make. So, um, so yeah, the, there, there's the, the blessing and the curse with air carbon is that it can do so many different things. And so one of the, the things that we've had to do is try to focus on, okay, yes, it can do electronics and automotive and, and all these different things. But we, we sort of stepped back and said, all right, where can we have the most impact today? And for that, we decided to really try to address ocean plastic pollution vis-a-vis -vis foodware. So it's a, it's, a, it's a major focus for us. And then also, um, given the, the net carbon negative footprint of the material, um, we, we looked at fashion as a great place to start because it is a huge, huge contributor to um, you know, many of our environmental challenges. So that's where we're starting. But then beyond there, there's just, there's just a world of applications. and it's now you know, a big focus on ours to be able to continue to scale our production capacity so we can get into more and more spaces. Absolutely. Well, look, it's, it's, been, it's been great to, uh, coming on the show. Thanks so much. And uh, it's been great hearing about the story and the, and the journey. And I uh, really wish you all the best uh, for the future and we'll be rooting for you. Well, thanks, Simon. I appreciate being on. And uh, yeah, good luck with everything and hope to talk to you soon.